to today's welcome to today's webinar. Uh, my name is Karen Sanderson, um, and I'm leading the IFR for MPO project on behalf of uh, SIPFA, the Chartered Institute of Public Finance and Accountancy. Uh, and I'm joined today by my colleague Samantha Musoke, uh, who is the project lead for Humentum. Uh, and together, um, SIPFA and Humentum are leading this project. Um, today's webinar is part of a series of outreach uh, events um, for um, the International Financial Reporting for Nonprofit Organizations consultation um, paper. Um, today's webinar is about the presentation of financial statements and narrative reporting. Uh, these are topics seven and 10 in part two of the consultation paper. Uh, and the objective of today's um, uh, webinar is to familiarize you with the content of these topics uh, and hopefully give you confidence to respond to the consultation uh, paper that is currently open for comment. Um, so the agenda today, um, let me move us on. So my, there we go. Um, so the agenda for today, we'll look at what we understand to be the issues facing nonprofit organization and the financial reporting challenges that this gives rise to um, in the context of today's topics. Um, we'll also look at the different approaches outlined in the consultation paper about how we might take forward those issues. Uh, and we'll finish on the consultation questions and how you can respond to these. And we've got some polls to get your input through the webinar, the results of the polls, as well as giving you opportunities to ask questions as we go through. Um, if you've got any questions that sort of pop into your head um, as I'm going through the content, please add those to the chat at any time. Um, we'll, we'll capture those uh, and we'll, we'll, come, we'll come to them when we get an opportunity. Um, we expect the webinar to run um, between two and two and a half hours, probably closer to two, uh, but that will be dependent on the number of questions um, that you have. Um, I can assure you that we won't run beyond two and a half hours, um, and if we've not answered all of your questions, um, we will follow up um, after today's session. Um, so um, we're proposing 10 topics for inclusion in the first set of nonprofit um, guidance. Um, the 10 topics cover matters relating to re the reporting entity, revenue and expenses, aspects of the balance sheet, and matters relating to the presentation content and scope of financial statements, which is where we're focusing today. Um, we won't be able to cover all MPO specific issues in the first set of guidance, so it's important that we include the ones that have the highest priority for the sector. Um, the overview in part two of the consultation paper looks at all the issues that, that have been um, raised with us so far uh, and takes you through how we've prioritised these. Um, as part of the consultation, we're seeking feedback on the entire list of issues and their prioritisation to get your input. Um, in, in looking at each of these issues, we're really focused on the project guidance objectives that go to the quality, credibility, transparency, and comparison. Um, the objectives are also focused on meeting the needs of users of financial statements, but in doing so, also balancing the needs of preparers as well. So today we will look at financial statement presentation, which is topic seven in the consultation paper and narrative reporting, which is topic 10 in the consultation paper. Um, the type of information provided to stakeholders in general purpose financial statements and communicating with stakeholders has been a consistent issue um, raised with us in our outreach discussions. Uh, and that includes the scope of donor reporting information and how they use financial, information, financial statements too. Uh, narrative reporting or non-financial reporting is currently really mixed across the globe, with many jurisdictions having no narrative reporting guidance for non-profit organisations. Uh, and this is recognised as a, an area of great importance to stakeholders, who as well as wanting to understand the financial statements, want other information on the operations of the entity. 
So that's what we're going to be covering um, today. But rather than hearing me um, speak through, throughout, um, I'm going to uh, play you a, a, a video. And this is a video with, uh, that's an interview between myself um, and, and Sam um, to kind of look at what are the experiences that, that people have, the real life experiences and trying to bring them to life for you. So I'm going to now play that video. Okay, Sam, you've been interacting with Okay, Sam, you've been interacting with project stakeholders from all over the world uh, and also reviewing sample financial statements that people have sent us and that are available on our website. You must have seen a really interesting range of presentation options and different types of challenges that people have experienced. Um, can you uh, give us some examples of those? Sure, well, as, as you said, it's, it's been a real privilege to talk to different people and see such a range of approaches that have popped up all, all over the world. Um, so I thought I'd prepare a, a simple set of illustrative financial statements prepared in different ways that could help frame our conversation. Uh, I should mention that these are common existing practice around the world, much as it's not exhaustive, but they're not the alternatives that are being presented for the guidance, uh, which is what you'll be sharing with us later. So here it is. So we have the basic structure of any financial statements as the story of what happened between two points in time. So the opening and closing balance sheets here are made up of the three core elements, assets and liabilities. And then that third box could be called funds or equity or net assets, whether they're presented vertically or horizontally. Then we have the story of what happened during the year in financial terms as income and expenditure. So as well as general income that can be used for anything within the organization's objectives, some income comes with stipulations, whether they are restrictions or conditions or performance obligations. Now we covered that in some detail in our webinar on the 21st of July. So without getting into all those details, I'm just gonna use the word limited use or the term limited use to cover all those ideas. So for this illustration, let's imagine the organization generates general revenue of 20 and spends 19 of that. Uh, it also gets revenue with limitations of 150 and spends 100 of that with the balance of 50 to be spent the following year. Then if the opening funds are 10, you'd add on the 51 and you'd end up with 61 at the end of the year. So that's one way of presenting it, but there are lots of other ways to present exactly the same information. So here we have the two column or multi-column presentation. You could also just have one column like that. Sometimes income and expenses are transferred from restricted to unrestricted as conditions are met, like this. Then depending on the accounting policy, income with limitations could be deferred like this. So here's the 50 unspent income uh, so that it appears in liabilities section of the balance sheet. Um, and then you'd have that could either be in a single column or a multi-column presentation either way. And then the movement in funds would be starting with 10, adding one and ending up with 11. And then finally, there's this T account presentation, which is common in India and elsewhere. And so Sam, it's really great to see those illustrative examples side by side. And I think it helps to frame the conversation. Um, and whilst, as you say, it's not exhaustive, I'm sure people will be able to see something in what you've just uh, described there that, that they're familiar with. Um, so let's just focus in a bit. I'm interested to hear about any particular challenges in presenting revenue that is not freely available. Perhaps you can talk about that. So I have heard of cases where board members or community members have seen you know, a large bank balance or a large surplus number and they've drawn wrong conclusions. And it's really important that it's clear those funds aren't freely available. Then in many countries, if, uh, if tax authorities see unspent income presented as a surplus, that could be interpreted as if it's a taxable profit. And that's a really strong motivation for MPOs to want to present uh, unspent income as a liability. But overall, I noticed generally a strong tendency for people to prefer 
whatever presentation model they're used to from Colombia, USA, Europe, Middle East and India. But interestingly, there was general agreement that most of the information needs can be met if there's adequate additional analysis in the notes, irrespective of the overall presentation that's chosen. Mm. Well, that's a good start point in, in terms of that kind of con consensus. And um, still on the theme of income with limited use, have you come across particular challenges related to the presentation of donated assets or grants for assets? Yes, lots of challenges. I mean, I might think this is one of the biggest challenges and certainly the single greatest reason why cash accounting is so prevalent in the non-profit sector globally. Obviously, if a donor has paid for an asset, they want to see the cost of that asset as an expense. They're not really interested in depreciation. So we see many NPOs expensing donor funded assets to meet their donor reporting needs, even if that's not in line with accounting principles. Uh, in East Africa, where I live, it's common for NPOs to first expense an asset from the donor fund and then capitalize it by crediting a capital fund. Uh, this some problems, but it creates other problems. Uh, and I've got a lovely short clip here from Erastus Omolo. He shared seven challenges he experiences with donated assets. I'm going to play just four of them for you here, which are numbers two, three, five, and seven on his list. Two, disclosure in the financial reports where assets have already been expensed. Three, treatment of own acquired assets and donated assets within the same set of financial reports. Conflicting policies occur when one is expensed and the other is capitalized. Five, matching principle. Spread of utilization of the cost of the asset is restricted. Expensing assets in year of acquisition, yet the project duration is longer. And seven, which is my final point, is the problem of double counting. When we expense and at the same time pick up the cost of the asset and uh, depreciate the same on the face of the balance sheet, again, it leaves us with an issue there. Thank you. So we heard Erastus there referring to the matching principle, which was a fundamental accounting concept where many of us were, were training and taking our exams. And it still feels a really intuitive way to think about the income statement. I myself only learned relatively recently that this matching principle is no longer at the heart of the ISB conceptual framework. Karen, what, what happened there? <laughs> Yeah, Sam, let, let, let's, let's talk about that because I think it is, um, it, it comes up time and time again. So the IASB conceptual framework was amended in 2018 and that included new definitions of assets and liabilities. Um, so income as part of this um, new framework is defined as an increase in assets and expenditure as an increase in liabilities. And often that results in the same outcome as using what was the matching concept but it means that in, in some cases uh, income is um, deferred um, and that deferral type approach, um, while it might feel intuitive, is in line with the conceptual framework. This is clearly something we're going to have to face um, as, as a project, um, as I said, because we, we hear about it time and time again. Um, we've also... Um, been hearing time and again in our outreach about how donors are really important set of stakeholders in our context. Um, have you had any feedback about how useful general purpose financial reports are for donors? Absolutely, uh, lots of lots of conversations. But I'd love to share this video uh, I have from Barbara Schneider Gibbets in Austria, uh, concluding rather discouragingly that many of their donors are largely indifferent. To the efforts that they put into their general purpose financial reports. We are a global disability and development organization which raises funds in Europe and the US and implements projects primarily in Sub-Saharan Africa. 
Let's look at the private donors first. In my experience, they do not really bother to look at our financial statements. Maybe it is too time consuming if it is only about a smaller donation. Maybe the presentation is too technical. Most likely, however, the donors rely on the Austrian donations quality seal, which we hold. To put it short, our financial statements are basically useless for the majority of our donors who account for more than half of our donations. This leaves the other half of our funding, which comes from major donors like foundations and public bodies. The first step in the process is to win a grant, but the financial statements are not really helpful in this respect. It goes without saying that we want to appear as cost efficient as possible, which in our world translates into specific ratios between program expenses on one side and administration and fundraising expenses on the other side. However, it is next to impossible to extract this information from our financial statements, even though we are fully compliant. And what about our donors who require reporting based on cash accounting while we need to stick to accrual accounting? Even the simple down payment in one period with a corresponding expense in a consecutive period can cause enough problems, not to mention capital assets. To summarize, our financial statements do not really meet the needs of our donors. We have to invest a lot of extra time and effort to meet different donor logics, but most of this work unfortunately is useless for other purposes. On a positive note, uh, we have convened a donor reference group that includes the World Bank, uh, USAID, FCDO in the UK, uh, the Global Fund and a number of other foundations. And we're receiving input from them, even as we speak, for their suggestions on how general purpose financial reports might be presented in a way that could really be useful for them. And this could potentially reduce the burden of due diligence and multiple audits moving forward. I mean, that's clearly really important um, from, the, from the project's perspective and, and encouraging that that is in place. So look forward to hearing more about how that's progressing uh, as the project develops. Um, moving on to think about reserves. Um, have you heard about challenges associated with understanding reserves? Absolutely. Um, I know that, for example, for some of the foundations that Humentum has worked with, uh, we've been training desk officers who review the financial statements of potential grantees. Um, and this is something that they're really interested to understand as part of their due diligence assessment. Um, depending on how reserves are defined, that may, might be the number 11 in that example, that those illustrations we shared earlier. Um, but often it's not easy to find that number in the financial statements. Uh, and what if the number was three or 500? What's the appropriate level of reserves uh, for that organization? And do they have less or more than they need? Uh, it could be really useful to see that in the narrative report. I also, I spoke to a consultant who'd worked with many NPOs across the Middle East, and he explained that nearly 100% of many organizations, 100% of their income, comes from a grant with use limitations, which of course is really common across the sector. Um, in this one case he shared with me, the managers and the board had never really stopped to think about building reserves just because it seemed so impossible. Um, but nearly a year later, uh, two of their major donors pulled out and the organization folded, which is just such a, such a shame. Interestingly, what we're seeing for some uh, more progressive donors is that they're actually giving grant funds specifically to enable organizations to grow their reserves. I think that's a really interesting development we're seeing now. Yeah, no, absolutely. That's fascinating. I think the non-profit motive sometimes makes people think that it's not appropriate to, to have reserves, um, but organizations need to be resilient. So I think it's a really important issue um, and perhaps should have more focus um, in the sector. So really good to hear about those. Now finally, let's look at narrative reports. What issues have people shared with you about narrative reporting? So uh, for those countries that don't have detailed guidance, one of the key challenges is how much detail to put in. Um, and we see everything from a minimal single page focused on, you know, companies act requirements. Uh, for see something like the results of the year one, which doesn't really mean anything at all in an NPO context. 
And then at the other end of the spectrum, there are narrative reports with fabulous 80 pages of glossy photographs, indicators, targets, achievements, quotes and stories. A really, really wonderful investment of time. Um, but with so many pages, it can be hard to see the wood for the trees sometimes. And you might have lots about achievements, but maybe not so much risks or governance. So I think the key challenge is, is that balance, isn't it, of having enough of the right kind of information that will really add value and be relevant to a wide range. Just balancing that with the, that creating too much of a huge burden on preparers. That's the, that's the challenge I see. Absolutely. And that sits at the heart of this project, balancing the needs of different stakeholders and balancing that with preparers as, as well. You know, that's one of the, the key objectives that we have in developing the guidance. Um, so Sam, thank you for sharing those examples. I think it helps to bring this issue um, to life for us uh, and hopefully really good context uh, for, the, for the rest of this webinar. So thank you again. So as, as well as thanking um, uh, Sam there, I wanted to uh, extend my thanks to all of those who provided uh, examples that, that Sam was able to share. And I think, uh, Sam, you wanted to say a couple of words. Yes, thanks, Karen. Yeah, in, in addition to Erastus Amolo and Barbara um, Schneider-Gibbets there, I also wanted to recognise Daniel Sarmiento Pavas in Colombia, who's our tag member there, uh, Tejas Mayer Desai in India, uh, who also shared examples with me, our Humentum Associate Graham Throop in France, who's had a lot of experience in, in the Middle East, and also um, the Humentum Associates working on the Administrative Cost Project, and they've done comparative analysis of 90 sets of financial statements from 10 countries. So I just want to reach out and thank, thank them so much for their time and sharing their uh, experience with us. It's really helpful. Great. Thank you, Sam. Okay, so... Um, Getting into um, sort of uh, the next uh, part of the webinar, which is really focusing on the financial um, reporting um, challenges. Um, and we're looking at those associated with the, with, um, the financial uh, statements uh, and focusing on restricted funds, information useful to funders and issues related to reserves. Uh, and we're also looking at um, financial reporting and other challenges associated with the narrative reporting, which, as I said before, has been consistently um, raised and needs to work together with the financial statements, as we were just discussing. Um, so in, turn, in terms of looking at those financial reporting um, challenges, uh, in the consultation paper, we're focusing on um, two uh, aspects of, of it. We're talking about presentation uh, and we're talking about disclosure as they have been um, fed into us as kind of the most significant financial reporting issues for those topics. Uh, and I think as you, as you saw in the video with a topic like presentation of financial statements, there are many aspects that we could cover. Um, but I think we see that at the top of many people's lists are the, assist, the issues associated with the presentation of resources provided to MPOs that come with some kind of limitation. Um, and sometimes because the contributor wants to see how the resources they're providing have been applied, um, and particularly if they only want them applied to, to particular activities or purposes. Um, and kind of also uh, how the specific reporting requirements of contributors fit with general purpose financial reports. Uh, and that came out loud and clear through Barbara's video. Um, for narrative reporting, many MPOs have no specific guidance um, to assist in determining what should be disclosed in narrative reports and how this should be presented. And these collectively kind of lie at the heart of the challenges that we've discussed in, in the consultation paper. So we're going to kind of walk through those. Um, so first looking at kind of stakeholder needs. Um, general purpose um, financial reports are intended to meet the common information needs of stakeholders in holding an entity to account and to support decision making. Uh, and I'm going to emphasize the word common there. They provide information to stakeholders that an individual stakeholder might not ordinarily be able to access because they're on their, on their own. They have insufficient power to exert over the organization. So that could be an individual member of a community who's interested in what um, a particular MPO is doing for their community, 
but you know they are one voice amongst many and may not have the, the power to ask the MPO to provide them with specific information. So the general purpose um, financial reports uh, go to the heart of meeting those needs. Um, special purpose financial reports do not have the same general application um, and can be developed for specific purposes or for a specific stakeholder or stakeholder groups. Uh, and I would say that many reports that are required by um, funders um, or large donors fit into that category. Uh, and as we look at the financial challenges associated with financial statement presentation, um, we are going to focus on that general purpose um, aspect. Um, I think as kind of Igor referred to, I mean, general purpose financial statements, I think are necessarily an aggregation of an organization's transactions. Um, financial statements result from processing large numbers of transactions from events that take place in a reporting period. And it's highly unlikely that any individual transaction is identifiable in financial statements themselves, um, but clearly they sit behind it. Um, but there, there can be obviously be exceptions to that. So if there was a single um, significant material transaction like a sale of a building or the only receipt of an endowment in a particular reporting period, because they are single and large uh, and appear in a category that's disclosed in the financial statements, that might be visible. Um, and as part of this project, we will consider the extent to which stakeholders differing views can be accommodated in a single set of general purpose financial statements that are intended to meet the needs of many stakeholders. Um, and we recognise that this is a challenge that MPOs can face. Um, balancing the competing needs of different stakeholders um, is an important consideration, but general purpose financial statements are on the whole prepared from the reporting entity's perspective and gives them the opportunity to communicate the information they think is relevant to their stakeholders. Um, so that means that financial statements will reflect reporting entities, accounting policies, classification of assets, liabilities, revenue and expenses. Um, materiality judgments will be based on the entity's overall operations uh, and not a subset of its operations. Um, so in setting those, the, the entity will be looking at the things that it thinks are important from that whole of entity perspective, and that might not be the focus of an individual stakeholder. So different stakeholders may have different views about the information um, that should be presented, and there could be a wide range of information about an, a nonprofit organization's financial and non-financial performance that they actually would like access to. Uh, and attempting to provide all of the information stakeholders may wish to see in the financial statements could be complex and also costly if they aren't all completely uh, or aligned or, or significantly aligned. And also by providing varying perspectives on the same transactions could only confuse the users of financial statements and actually serve to decrease understandability. Uh, so that's, those are some important considerations. Um, Sam talked about restrictions, we talked about that in our, in our video discussion, and some assets or resources may only be capable of being used for particular purposes because of a res restriction that a contributor has placed. Um, at, at the other end, um, other assets and resources can be used at the entire discretion of, an, of the nonprofit organisation and uh, assigned to their priority priorities. Um, separating funds that distinguish between assets or resources that are restricted for a particular purpose from those that can be used for any purpose can provide um, greater transparency. Um, it may be important um, for stakeholders to understand what is at the general um, discretion of the MPO. So the nature of the different types of funds that make up an MPO's net assets provide a financial reporting uh, challenge. And uh, Sam uh, shows some of the various different presentations um, that is part of illustrative examples. Um, in addition to resources or assets with restrictions, assets or resources could be accompanied with conditions 
with entitlement to the asset or resource only coming when the MPO has performed a specific activity. So users might not understand that where a contribution has a condition, a liability may have, uh, may be, may have been recognised and the revenue deferred. Some donors may expect an MPO to recognise revenue from contribution that they've made um, straight away and see it directly as part of, all, of overall revenue and may be confused or worried uh, about what's happened to the funds they've provided if they're not able to see the revenue in the income statement. Disclosing the accounting treatment for contributions that have conditions could be useful to explain why a contribution made is not recognised in the financial statements. Um, sort of almost uh, in the sort of reverse of that, um, a cash contribution might be recognised in one financial year um, where it has no conditions, um, but the related expense might not happen to a subsequent financial um, year. Uh, and again, there may be some confusion as users might not understand the misalignment between these transactions because they expect to see a direct link between the contribution and the intended activity. So, so two points of complexity there. Um, one of the ways um, to address the issues about assets and resources with restrictions is to, main separate, to maintain separate financial statements for each fund or reserve. So there's a clear distinction between those assets and reserves that are restricted and those that can be freely used. Um, so having a, a separate type of fund or reserve that shows each restricted contribution could address the problem. Um, this approach is typically called fund accounting. Uh, and fund accounting involves each restricted contribution being shown separately so that the revenue is held in a separate reserve until it's used for the purpose that is allowed by the restriction. Expenses incurred will then be applied to the reserve to reduce the balance over time. Um, it's possible that some funds are separate reporting entities because of the nature of the restriction. Um, we're not gonna go into that now, but that will also be kind of a management consideration. Um, where an MPO has very, um, a very limited number of restricted funds, presenting each fund or reserve separately might be feasible in the columns that you know, Sam uh, 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 used in her illustration, for example. However, it could be impractical to do this if the MPO has a large number of contributions um, with individual restrictions. And as the number of funds increases, so could the complexity of the financial statements with a separate fund presented for each contribution financial statements could become much larger in volume. Um, but, you, but there is a possibility of aggregating um, funds so that similar types of funds or reserves appear together in the financial statements. Uh, and that would mean fewer funds would be presented and simplify the presentation. Providing information about restricted funds can increase transparency but presentation could at the same time make the financial um, statements more difficult to understand. Uh, reporting or presenting additional information might also increase the costs um, for MPOs. However, understanding each of these funds will um, be needed to comply with stipulations placed. So MPOs will need some, at least some of this information for their own purposes in managing each of the funds in any case. Um, it might be more difficult to provide a fund presentation for some of the financial statements. Um, the income statement generally lends itself to a fund presentation. Um, the financial position statement, the balance sheet, could show uh, the fund balances separately, but presenting fund balances for assets and liabilities could be much more challenging. You know, identifying um, uh, um, payable and receivable balances could make life much more complex. Um, one of the points made um, about stakeholders uh, at the beginning of this section um, was that funders may have specific reporting requirements that might not be met by general purpose financial reports. Uh, I think as Sam talked about in the video, um, frequently stakeholders are looking for cash-based information to understand where funds that they have provided have been applied. Um, with this focus on cash, uh, 
stakeholder needs could potentially be met by a cash flow statement that shows the source and application of funds separated by fund or program or something like that. Um, the preparation of a cash flow statement separated by fund that analyzes receipts and payments could address um, one of those one of the significant reporting challenges. If cash flow statements were to be used for this purpose, it would require all cash receipts and payments to be recorded by fund. Um, this also could be difficult or onerous if the MPO has multiple funds or programs. Um, it also begs the question of whether this type of approach is appropriate for general purpose financial statements that are intended to be used by a wide range of stakeholders. I think that's an important question um, to answer. Uh, and even if this approach was adopted, it could be challenging because of system limitation, um, cost uh, and effort involved in producing it. I'm going to turn now to reserves. So reserve management has been raised several times as part of the project, frequently in the context of there being no guidance about what is appropriate by way of reserves for MPOs. Um, Deciding what level of reserves to hold, however, is primarily, primarily a matter of management um, policy to support the strong financial management of the nonprofit organisation. Uh, in itself, it's not a financial reporting challenge for general purpose um, financial reports. Um, but in the context of strong financial management, the disclosure of um, an organisation's policies on reserves may help stakeholders understand management's decisions and to the point we were making earlier, uh, resilience. Um, uh, uh, Nonprofit organisations might decide to set aside amounts for specific purposes for internal management reasons, such as putting aside reserves for capital purposes or to invest in new initiatives or activities. Um, if these are reported separately from um, non-profit organisations, other finances, and importantly, other reserves, such as restricted reserves, I think this can help provide greater transparency about the MPO's operations and the amounts available to fund its ongoing operations. With no existing guidance around the importance and appropriateness of reserves, MPOs may find it helpful to have guidance on when reserves should be created and how they should be managed. Um, so let's turn now to specifically look at, at the reporting challenges associated with non-financial reporting information. Uh, and by non-financial reporting, um, we're considering the narrative information that sits outside of the financial statements. Uh, and this can be variously called non-financial reporting, narrative reporting or management commentary. Um, but it is that information that sits outside of the financial statements. Um, the first challenge is, is around which framework um, to use. Uh, Non-financial reporting has become a growth industry in recent years with a proliferation of frameworks, codes, standards and guidelines on a wide range of reporting issues, um, many in the broad area of sustainability, um, also referred to as corporate responsibility, corporate social responsibility, and environment, or I can't get my words out, environmental, social and governance, uh, so-called ESG reporting. Um, there's a huge amount um, of um, information uh, in that space. Um, there's also a, an increasing focus on reporting on climate related is, uh, issues. So an initial challenge would be to determine which of the multiple frameworks, codes, standards and guidelines would be most appropriate on which to develop uh, proposals for narrative reporting for MPOs. Uh, and aligned with this is the scope of such guidance, particularly in the context of sustainability um, reporting, where, as I said, there is kind of increasing focus. Uh, one aspect to consider um, around uh, non-financial reporting is uh, at what level uh, should we pitch any proposals around um, non-financial reports. Should proposals uh, for non-profit organisations be pitched at a framework level, articulating broad principles and content elements to be included? Or should it be more specific with 
um, prescribed items and, and measures to be included. Uh, prescribed items could form part of the notes to the financial statements themselves or be part of non-financial reporting. Uh, if I can give an example of that, so um, disclosures relating to costs and their categorization, including ratio analysis um, or ratio analysis associated with those kinds of costs could be included as disclosures through the notes to the financial statements or part of a narrative description outside of the financial um, statements. Um, choose making a choice between those has uh, implications for audit, which I'll come back to shortly. Um, and, and we heard earlier in terms of what Barbara said that, you know, um, ratio analysis is something um, that can be, can be important. Um, the general principles and content elements of non-financial reporting could be applicable to all, all organisations, although the appropriate level of detail could differ depending on factors such as size, complexity um, and resources. Um, if we take a principles-based approach, this offers um, flexibility to taking those into account. Uh, and this might be relevant in, to consider in the context of calls that have been made for nonprofit organization narrative reporting to address a variety of matters, including remuneration of key management personnel and related parties. Um, it's also worth noting um, that requirements in local jurisdictions could add to or be inconsistent with disclosures that are arising from a framework type approach. Um, narrative, um, I'll just turn it to sort of look at um, uh, bias because um, narrative reporting is usually prepared from the perspective of the management organization, hence sometimes being called management co commentary. And narrative reporting provides an opportunity for management to provide to stakeholders its perspective of the organization's performance, position and progress. With an opportunity for management to describe what it has achieved, that opportunity to communicate important uh, stakeholder information um, comes with a, an offset that there may be risk of bias, whether conscious or probably most likely unconscious um, bias. Um, Descriptions about the nature of an MPO's organisation and its objectives and strategies for achieving those objectives uh, might be straightforward. But where narrative reporting looks at significant resources, risks and relationships, uh, the results of operations and prospects for the future and key performance measures and indicators um, that management uses to evaluate performance, um, this might be more challenging. Um, the inclusion of information that both complements and supports the financial statements, as well as providing forward-looking information, comes with a challenge in ex exercising judgment about what data to include, how much data, and to present it in a way that's not over-optimistic. A framework approach based on pr principle demands more judgment from management than a more prescriptive approach. Uh, faced with uncertainty about how to interpret guidance or what to include if there is no guidance, there is a risk that management will err on the side of caution and disclose larger quantities of data rather than exercising the judgment required to present the information that meets stakeholder needs. Um, this could generate confusion rather than transparency if reports become overly complex. Um, some aspects of narrative reporting can involve more uncertainty than the information presented in the financial statements. Um, that's particularly the case if there is provision of forward-looking information. Um, it could be um, appropriate for management to explain any material assumptions uh, in the preparation and provide those as part of the narrative too. Um, There'll be challenges in the inclusion of non-financial measures and indicators where management will have to explain um, why those measures, why those indicators, how they've been, been defined and calculated. Reporting in a balanced way, dealing even handedly with both good and bad aspects of performance, progress and prospects um, is, um, is, is not just a challenge for MPOs, it's a challenge for all entities but it's important that we recognize that, that it exists. 
Um, integrated reporting, um, and this term is, is widely used. Uh, in terms of this project, we're using integrated reporting to mean a report that explains how an organization creates value over time by providing insight about the resources it has, the relationships it has, um, and, uh, and, how it, and how it affects uh, other organizations. Um, it links together financial statements with um, the external environment in which the NPO operates to provide a more holistic view of the entity. So that's what we're, we're talking about here. So an integrated report could look at a number of um, dimensions and explain um, funding that has, has been made or um, investment it's making and always making in, in kind of a range of dimensions. Uh, and the types of uh, activities that, uh, that a nonprofit organization could be looking at is um, funding um, or financial investments in, in assets, investments it's making in its own people, um, how it's relating to the environment. Um, it could be making investments in innovation or research or investing in relationships and particularly um, with community um, that it's involved in. Um, and for some organizations, it may also be about goods and services that, that it provides that also requires investment. Depending on how it is defined, an integrated report could be focused on an NPO's um, operating uh, performance, both in the short and long term, and also in the sustainability of its operations. It could look at the services that it's providing and it could have a, a it could also look at social or environmental impact that it has. Uh, I think, as I said before, increasingly organizations are focused on sustainability reporting, whether that's more narrowly defined in terms of environment or climate reporting, or whether it's more broadly um, defined in terms of sustainability development um, goals, the, the, the so-called SDGs developed by the UN. Any or all of these could be the core proposition behind MPO narrative reporting. But we need to keep in focus that the challenge here is about reporting the needs of stakeholders. And um, much of the narrative reporting that currently takes place at both international and, and national levels is within an organization's annual report, but it sits outside of the financial statements. Um, disclosures that are within the financial statements fall within the scope of the annual audit process. Information that sits outside of the financial statement is not uh, within the scope of the audit. Um, I say this, but there are also, although it's not within the scope of the audit, there are requirements on the auditors to review the information to ensure that it is um, consistent with what is in the financial statements. Um, the purpose of the review is to identify any material inconsistencies between the information in the narrative report and financial statements, uh, and also any knowledge that the auditors have gained in the order. Um, so there is some scrutiny of it, but it, it doesn't go to the same degree as, as the order. So as a consequence, um, narrative reporting outside of the financial statements falls outside of the scope of the formal opinion by um, the auditors on financial statements. Um, and the review work that is carried out uh, is a level of assurance that is less than um, required by a formal audit. Um, with potentially a broad scope for non-financial information, uh, assurance can be challenges, um, but it is important to the integrity of the information that's being provided um, and really important to have determined what should be in narrative reports and what should be within the notes to the financial statements. Um, so I'm going to um, pause um, there and